Uh, so my name is Karel Numert. Uh, I joined what used to be Planet OS uh, a bit more than a year ago in September 2016. And I basically work as a backend uh, developer, developing and maintaining the backend of our uh, data platform. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about Elasticsearch. Uh, I will assume no prior knowledge. Uh, and because Elast we, you can talk about Elasticsearch for uh, quite a long time, so I'll uh, do a brief overview of uh, what it is, then show you how it works, and then tell you how it works. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, OK, let's move on. Then. Um, so Elasticsearch, uh, as it says here, distributed RESTful uh, near real-time search and analytics engine. So um, uh, it's designed to be scalable from the ground up. Uh, near real-time means that uh, if you index some data into your Elasticsearch cluster, then it won't be available for search immediately, but uh, by default within one second. Um, or but the refresh interval is uh, configurable, so you can uh, increase it if you need uh, more real-time uh, search um, uh, search ability, or you can uh, increase the refresh interval if uh, your uh, use case is very index-heavy and uh, you don't need to uh, have the do document searchable um, as fast. It's written in Java, so it perfectly fits our uh, Java advanced Java meetup. Um, well, uh, it's built on Apache Lucene, as uh, was mentioned previously, and we'll talk a bit more about uh, uh, how exactly it's using uh, Lucene in a little bit. Uh, it is open source, so you can go and contribute if you like, or fix bugs uh, if you found, uh, find some. Uh, it's developed by a company called Elastic, um, they have a few other products that they're providing as well, such as Logstash and uh, Kibana, but I'm not going to go into more detail about those. Um, but they combine with Elasticsearch very well. Um, they have, I think, a th about a thousand contributors, so it's uh, quite actively um, being developed. And to give you a sense of uh, what it's capable of, it's... Uh, used by companies like uh, Wikipedia and GitHub for search. So if you search for an article on Wikipedia, it's actually powered by Elasticsearch. They used to have their own uh, homegrown Lucene-based uh, search engine, but they uh, swapped to Elasticsearch in about uh, 2014, I think. So they have uh, over 57 million uh, articles uh, indexed uh, in Elasticsearch. And, uh, available for search. Uh, GitHub, similarly, is using it as a search engine where you can search uh, repositories or code, but they're also using the analytics engine to uh, find if there are uh, performance issues in their uh, platform or if there are some malicious users, for example. They're doing all kinds of analytics. Uh, Uber and uh, NASA are both using it for analytics as well. They're both sending uh, sort of time series data into Elasticsearch that they're then uh, doing ag running aggregations on and uh, using Elasticsearch for analytics. Um, for example, NASA is sending uh, data from the Mars rover back to uh, the ground and uh, index it in Elasticsearch. So it, uh, it is used quite a lot. Um, before we actually look at Elasticsearch itself, a few concepts to make the demo more easily understandable. Um, before you can search or analyze your data, you need to get some data into Elasticsearch. Uh, and you do this by indexing the data into Elasticsearch. Um, you index documents, which uh, was, again, briefly discussed before. But basically, you can sort of think of it as a row in a relational database. Um, not quite exactly, because you can have uh, nested documents. Uh, but uh, but basically, you can think of it as a, um, a row in a, in a database. For example, uh, an article on uh, Wikipedia might be uh, a document um, or uh, just a one line, uh, like a one log line uh, from your Uber ride might be a document. 
Um, so when you index documents into Elasticsearch, um, documents will have something called mapping types, which describes the structure of the document. Uh, you can either create the mapping yourself, or you can have uh, Elasticsearch create it for you dynamically. Um, it makes quite good sense of the data you're sending, uh, but in some cases you might want to explicitly uh, describe the, the kind of data you're indexing. Uh, for example, if you're sending numbers and the first document that you send happens to have a number without decimals, Elasticsearch will treat it as an integer and you can no longer send a decimal number for the same uh, field. It will reject it saying it's the wrong type. Um, Right, so data types. Um, data types is basically what uh, mapping types are, are made of, uh, or, or the mapping of a type is made of. Um, you have all kinds, uh, strings and numerics as, as the usual. Um, some uh, geometry data types for points and more complex structures like polygons or rectangles. Um, but you can also have dates, date ranges. Uh, you can also have integer ranges. You can IP address. Uh, addresses which uh, then Elasticsearch makes sense of uh, for uh, searching. So uh, there's quite a uh, wide uh, variety. I think an important thing to mention is analyzers. Um, analyzers are what make text searchable uh, in Elasticsearch. So if you just send a whole uh, Wikipedia article as one text field to Elasticsearch, then uh, if you index the, if you put this in a relation database, it would be quite difficult to to search from it, uh, or if you or if you search from it, it would be, would be difficult to uh, understand uh, if you have two matching documents, which one is better, which one is uh, uh, worse. So Elasticsearch uses text analyzers to make sense of the text fields. Um, there are different kinds um, for different purposes, but for example, it can understand English. Um, so if you have uh, dog or dogs in different documents, it will understand it as the same term. And if you search for dog, it will match documents that contain dogs and vice versa as well. Um, I'll, I'll show you a few examples of analyzers uh, later on as well. Um, and another thing to mention about indexes, indexing is sometimes you want to update the documents. Um, and you might have different uh, or multi multiple clients working on the same Elasticsearch uh, cluster. So to avoid uh, cases where one overrides uh, the, the work of another uh, client, you can use optimistic uh, concurrency, where you specify, uh, you tell Elasticsearch what, what do you think is the version of the data indexed already in uh, the cluster. So Elasticsearch will then go and check if the version that is actually indexed is higher than the version you're saying, then it will reject your operation. Um, similarly, you can provide your own versioning. Uh, by default, Elasticsearch will do versioning for you, but you can pro provide your own versioning um, if the data you're um, indexing is already versioned. And then Elasticsearch will just check that every time you send new data, uh, either an update or a delete, it's, uh, the version is higher than uh, what you had previously. Um, right, and then another thing to mention is uh, search. So. Uh, there's loads of queries you can run. You can combine them. It's very powerful, um, as you can probably already make sense by uh, the fact that uh, Wikipedia is using it. So it's, I don't know if you've tried searching on Wikipedia, but it's quite easy to, to find uh, documents that you're actually interested in. in. Uh, so we'll I'll show you a few examples of, uh, of search. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, Elasticsearch actually helps you understand which documents that match your query um, have a better match than, than other documents. Um, the, for example, if you're searching for, for text uh, and you're searching for a certain keyword, then uh, it will uh, count documents that have more occurrences of the same word uh, higher than, than uh, documents that have less occurrences of the word. Um, so it uses ranking for this. There are some defaults which uh, actually work quite well, um, quite often. But always, uh, um, of course, there's a, uh, an ability to customize the, the way you want to rank your documents. You can have uh, boosts for certain fields, or you can even write scripts to uh, calculate the score 
uh, for a document. Um, and you can have some uh, search filters which don't uh, actually contribute to the score as well if you, if you want. Uh, all of this can become quite uh, confusing. So if you design a very complex uh, ranking system for your search um, and end up getting some weird results, then there's uh, actually an explain API as well, which you can use to, to understand how it came up with a, with a score for a document. Uh, and finally, aggregation. So that's what you use for analytics. Well, search is just giving you back a list of documents that matched your query uh, with the score uh, that marks the relevance of, of documents for your query. Then if you want to just get an understanding of, for example, you're, you're logging um, or you're sending your application logs to Elasticsearch and you want to see how many errors you have at certain times, then you can aggregate uh, log lines that are errors by uh, time and then get uh, counts for each time bucket. So um, the terms to keep in mind for aggregations are buckets. Buckets is basically a collection of uh, documents um, that have some sort of uh, shared characteristic uh, that, uh, that, they, uh, that makes them fall into this, the same bucket. Uh, then you can have metrics, for example, um, if you have a, a list of documents that, that are in the same bucket, then you can count averages on them or sum up fields uh, from them or do all kinds of stuff. There's, uh, again, uh, a, vi a variety of uh, things you can do. And then, then what makes aggregations really powerful is that uh, the fact that you can actually nest them. So you can have aggregations within aggregations and uh, add metrics to different levels. Um, right, so any questions about this before I show you a few Right, yes. Uh, well, that would have been uh, very clear from uh, uh, the demo, but yes, uh, Elasticsearch uh, is using JSON. You can't really successfully push anything other than JSON uh, into it. Yes, well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you how Elasticsearch uh, works uh, in a little while, and then uh, um, we'll see what maps to what in, in Lucene. The, the main difference between Elasticsearch and Lucene is that uh, uh, Elasticsearch is distributed. So it's uh, very easily scalable, uh, whereas uh, Lucene isn't. Any other comments or questions? Right, so uh, let's move on. Demo. Uh, we'll try changing the display settings once more. Because I need to see what you see. Right. Ha. Okay, so uh, before I run this, uh, I just wanted to mention that it's very easy to run Elasticsearch. Um, you can download the, an archive. I guess you can't see it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll change it uh, when I've uh, finished saying what I was going to say. Uh, so you can download an archive from their website, unzip it, and then just run the executable within it. That's, uh, that's basically it. That's what I've done. Uh, by default, it will have a RESTful interface on uh, port 9200. Uh, so I haven't changed any of the uh, defaults. Another thing I've done is I've already created a mapping uh, in this index, because um, that's not very exciting. And I've also uh, put some test data into it, but I'll show you how to uh, push documents into Elasticsearch as well. So, uh, let's see. Someone from the back row. Can you see now? Yes, at least one of you can. You need glasses. Because I, I mean, I have some content as well that, that needs to fit in it. So, uh, the first, the first query that I'm going to run is using the mapping endpoint to uh, get all the mappings of all the indexes in Elasticsearch. Uh, in this case, there will be just one uh, with one uh, laser with with one type. 
it already has data in it, uh, but actually it doesn't matter because this uh, mapping was created by myself. Um, this isn't generated by Elasticsearch because I wanted to uh, tweak a few fields that Elasticsearch would uh, map differently than uh, I wanted it to. So you can see that the, this is the name of the index, children. Uh, so the story is that uh, Santa uh, has an overloading uh, load of children with their wishes that he needs to uh, fulfill by Christmas. So we're helping him with uh, Elasticsearch uh, database uh, to make sense of it. Um, then there's a mapping type, child. Uh, and the mapping type has the following properties. Uh, right. Date of birth, which is date. Uh, location, which is geo point. Uh, location is one of the fields that Elasticsearch uh, wouldn't, by default, recognize as a, um, a geo point. It would recognize it as, a, as an object, I think. Um, so, but, but if we uh, have it as a geo point, then we can run queries on it that uh, make sense of the actual coordinates uh, that we uh, store in the field. Then name, so the child will have a name. Uh, the name is text, and it will use the, uh, the standard analyzer. We'll look at the analyzer in a, in a minute, um, which basically just uh, strips any punctuation, sp uh, splits on uh, white spaces, and lower cases the, the tokens. Um, and then all of those tokens will then b uh, be added to an inverted index, which will map back to the document. Um, but also, w I've added uh, a full, full sort of subfield uh, to the name, which is using a keyword type. So keyword doesn't do any analyzing uh, for the text. It will just keep it raw as, as is. So we can use this for uh, sorting. Because by default, Elastic doesn't, Elasticsearch, if you're using text uh, type and uh, the standard anal analyzer, it will split it into tokens. It will not keep, uh, will not index the raw data. So, for example, if you want to sort the results by the name of the child, you can't do this uh, without having a, a keyword, uh, a, a copy of the uh, text with a keyword type. Uh, then, obviously, Santa needs to know if the kids are naughty or nice. Uh, there's a boolean type uh, field here, and then we have wishes, which. Uh, well, naughty or nice, There's, it's a bo it's boolean. I mean, in a different database, you could have uh, like from you can have a double from zero to one if you prefer. But in this case, we're keeping it simple. And then wishes are type nested uh, and have the following properties: uh, age range, which is an integer integer range, uh, name, which uh, is this is so this is now the name of the wish, not the name of the child. We're using uh, English analyzer for this. Uh, so, if for example, if there are uh, words, English words in the name of the wish that are not in the stem form, that will cut it into stem form to make it easier to search by. We're also keeping it uh, as a raw, a raw copy of it. Um, we'll see later why. We need this for aggregations, basically. Um, and then we have a price, which is a double. Uh, so there's two very similar types. One is nested and one is object. Both allow you to have nested object, JSON objects in your document. The difference is object loses the relation between fields within the nested object. So we couldn't search for a child that wishes for an iPhone that uh, costs more than a thousand uh, um, euros, for example, because if, if we built the query like this, then what Elasticsearch would actually search for is a child that wishes for an iPhone and has a wish that uh, costs more than a thousand euros. So it sort of uh, loses the relationship uh, between the fields. Right, so now that we know what the structure of the data is, uh, let's see if we can actually push some data into it. Uh, so this is how this is one way of uh, pushing data into Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, so as I said, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you, f for example, if you wanted to have array of strings, you just say that it's a string, then, and if you 
index and document with an array of strings, then uh, it will just work. Uh, you don't need to specify whether it's uh, a field with a single value or a field with uh, multiple values. Yeah. Um, right, so you send the put request. Ah, bigger. I thought you meant something else. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, we lost half of the command, but it uh, doesn't matter. Is it readable now? Right, so we send a put request um, to, well, this is the address of uh, Elasticsearch. We specify the index, the type, and then in this case, we specify the ID as well. You don't actually has have to specify an ID for the document. Um, if, if you don't, then Elasticsearch will just generate it for you. Uh, JSON, as m mentioned, and then we just list the uh, document in JSON. Uh, simple as that. Uh, in this case, well, we only have one wish, but we're still uh, showing it as a, an array, probably because this came out of uh, Scala serializer, and uh, that that's different. That makes difference between uh, arrays and and not. Um, so the geo point will have two fields, uh, longitude and latitude, which are doubles. Um, yeah, an age range will have two fields, greater than or equal to and late, uh, less than or equal to. I don't think there's mo much more to see here, so we'll hit OK. Let's see if that didn't work for some reason. Yeah, right. Well, not much interesting to see here. Uh, it was successful. Uh, I guess they're sort of private fields. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not. Th so, for, for example, ID uh, will be. Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I have didn't come up with the um, uh, schema for, for the response, but I think maybe private is wrong, but they're, they're sort of Elasticsearch specific uh, fields. Um, and maybe they're not what you asked for. Result, is for example, for uh, some reason isn't. Uh, doesn't have an unders underscore, so. Um, but yeah, basically it will show the ID of the document, which in this case we specified, the index, and uh, yeah, the version, which we didn't specify, so it was uh, generated by Elasticsearch. Let's move on uh, to. Uh, dun dun dun. This is getting. Oh, come on. Right, so I wanted to say a th few things about analyzers. We're running out of time very quickly, so I probably won't show you all of the ones I have, but this is the standard one. So there's an endpoint analyze, which you can use to understand how the analyzers work. You can actually create your own analyzers as well. Analyzers consist of three things. Uh, they will have char filters, which uh, either add or remove chars from your uh, string, um, you can have zero or more of those. Then you will have exactly one tokenizer, which splits the text, uh, the, the text that has been through char filters, it splits it into tokens, and then you have a token filter, which again can add or remove or change uh, tokens. Um, and so the standard one has a, a standard set of those, uh, and we'll see what it actually does to the string. So the string was, Welcome to the advanced Java meetup, I think. Um, and had an uppercase W and uh, some punctuation at the end. So we can see that it's removed the uh, uh, white spaces. It's lowercased everything, split by white space, and re also removed the exclamation mark from the end. Um, so sort of did what it promised to. Uh, yeah. So the next one is English, which I also mentioned. Um, so this works slightly differently. It's we're still using the same uh, input string, but the output, we can see that welcome has lost a character from the end. So it wouldn't differentiate between welcome or welcoming, for example. Um, advanced as well. It could be just uh, advancing, I guess, or it sort of uh, removes rest of the word, just keeps the stem of the word. Um, 
and Java doesn't really understand, I guess, uh, or that's the initial form. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and meetup is, is the same as well. If you used meetups, then it would probably lose the S. Um, we quickly. Uh, what's this one? Oh, yeah. Uh, th this one is uh, useful as well uh, for text. Um, so, still the same string. Uh, welcome to the Lance Java meetup. But we're using an edge ngram uh, analyzer, which basically. Uh, just cuts the word into or the, or the string into uh, pieces of the words which you can use for I think the most common use case is uh, autocompletion so we'll see what it does to the string um, I added some filters token filters as well to lowercase uh, and remove commonly used words um, so we can see that welcome has been split into well welk welco Welcome, and I think it has welcome as well. So you can see that if you search for, if the user types in W A E L, then it will actually match this document because uh, you've used the edge word, uh, edge ngram uh, analyzer. And it's done similar things to other words as well, advanced, uh, yeah, adv, adva, etc. Um, and you can see that. It's mo it's removed the to uh, word, so you can there's welcome and then there's adv. So it's removed the commonly used words such as to and the, which probably don't give you useful matches for documents. Um, that was the stop um, token filter. Uh, and one more, uh, which isn't for normal text, but for paths of documents, which is again uh, well useful different things, I guess. But if you're searching for all files in a certain uh, folder hierarchy, then uh, this might be useful because it splits. It sort of understands that this is a path, um, and it splits it into sub paths, I guess, or super paths. I think is the um, more correct term. So that's all I wanted to say about analyzers. Uh, what's the next thing I want to talk about? Let's see. Right, so search. Um, so this is how you can search for documents. We've specified the index. You don't actually have to specify the index if you don't want to. Um, and we haven't specified the type, but you can if you want to. Um, so this is the endpoint that you use for searching. And this is a very simple query. We're just running a query on date to get children that are that have a birthday with a date greater than uh, now minus seven years, so I guess that would be children that are younger than seven years or up to seven years old, and uh, we're sorting them them by uh, their name. Note that notice that we're using dot full. Uh, that's to to use the whole string, not the the terms. You can't actually search by uh, by just name by default because name will be split into terms and uh, doesn't really make sense to sort by multiple terms. So, um, and they're actually not, not even uh, stored it, uh, su such that you could uh, search by them. Th they're only stored in the, uh, the terms are only stored in the inverted index by default. So they only point, point to the documents, but the documents doesn't know the terms it contains. Um, the output, this isn't very exciting. Um, it basically just lists so hits are all the documents that matched, um, and because we're searching by uh, a certain field, there's no score. Otherwise, it would uh, probably have a score as well. Uh, it just lists the source of the of the documents that matched. By default, I think it returns ten. And if we go to the end, <laughs> yes. By default, the score is uh, sourced by score. Um, so it will also tell you how many hits, hits there were. There's a, a total of uh, 1,000 documents, I think, in the Elasticsearch, and not all of them. Um, not all the children are under seven years old. Uh, let's move on. Right, 
So another example of search, um, I guess the more interesting bit is here. So remember we, oh there should be some, yeah there sh should be a bit of uh, imitation here, but um, w we, we stored the location of the, the child or the children uh, with coordinates. So we can now search for, for example, if Santa was here, this I think should be uh, the uh, coordinates of, of Tallinn, uh, the Viru circle, I think, or roundabout. Um, so if Santa was here and wanted to see if there are any kids around, he could run this query and then uh, we'd get the matching children. Um, again, the search results are pretty much the same, uh, it just lists all of them because we haven't told it to do anything different. You can see that in this case uh, it has uh, a score. Let's see if it's. Uh I think it's a, a constant score of one for all of them, uh, so it doesn't do any any special. Uh, it just either matches or not. It does. There's no uh, special handling of how far they are from the point. Uh, right. So this is now searching by text, uh, and we're using. This is a nested search, so we're u actually searching on the nested uh, objects. Um, and we're searching by the name of the wish. So for example, let's see if there are any um, children that would like kittens to be exploded. Um, so this is using the English analyzer. Uh, so it understands the text a bit better than others. Um, and we can see that it's found a George who is wishing for an exploding kittens card game. Um, don't know if you remember, but we actually searched for exploded, not exploding. So it did the understanding of English bit. By default, it uses the same analyzer for uh, search as it does for indexing. So it actually took the search string exploded kittens and used the same uh, English analyzer on it. So it split it into words and then uh, reduced the, the words to the stem form. So that's how I, it matched this. Um, and here we can see that it has a, a score that's different from one. So this is 4.61 something. Let's see if there's, uh, that's 61 as well. Uh, ah, okay, well, they are different. <laughs> uh, they're just d different by much, I guess. Uh, yeah, well. Anyway, uh, let's move on because we still want to cover a few more things. Here. Damn it. Okay. Uh, was basically, this this just wanted to show that we can combine um, the different queries into one to make a complex query. So we would search for uh, children that are not naughty and uh, have a filter for age and and location, etc. But uh, we're running out of time very quickly, so I'll uh, skip looking at the output of this and. Yes, this is aggregations. Um, we're, we're specifying size of zero because we're actually not interested in the documents that match. We just want to get the aggregations of the documents that match. And in this case, uh, we just want to see how the children distribute um, based on their year of birth. So what we'll do is we'll use the date histogram uh, type of aggregator on the date of birth field. We'll say that we're interested in uh, intervals with one year and uh, keep the format, give, give make the key to be in this format. So uh, I think by default it would uh, give you the, the, the format of the key with um, uh, the month and day as well, but we're not really interested in that. that uh, so we'll just say year. And uh, min.count1 means that don't give us uh, the empty buckets because by default it would uh, find the earliest date of birth and the latest date of birth and would create buckets for all the years in between. But th maybe there are some years that we don't actually have uh, children for. So we just wanna don't, don't want to see them. Uh, and so this would be the output. Um, uh, you would have buckets. 
It would, the, so H group is the name of the aggregation that we specified. And we can see that uh, there's one child born in, uh, born in uh, 1997, quite old. Uh, there's two in 2000 and uh, more as we, as we move closer to uh, today. So, and then, yeah. Does it, is there anything at the bottom? Uh, yeah, not really. It just here lists the number of hits. There's no hits because we specified we don't want to see any but it will tell you how many uh, matched. Right, uh, another example of aggregations, uh, this is Orcon, is this one here. So we can also run uh, aggregations on nested uh, fields. So in this case, we're running an aggregation of wishes. Uh, we just want to see uh, what are the price ranges of the wishes. So let's create three buckets. We could use a uh, histogram to say we w we're interested in buckets of 50 euros, but maybe that would be too many. So let's say we're just interested in what, how many gifts that uh, or wishes do we have that are af affordable? So the price up to 50 euros. Uh, how many are pricey? Uh, so more than 50 euros, but less than 500. And then the really expensive ones, uh, more than 500. Um, and we'll see. This is nice and short. So. It shows us that, uh, fortunately, most of the wishes are affordable, and there are quite a few expensive ones. I guess older children are wishing for more expensive things. And you can see the document count here is actually more than a thousand. So the nested uh, objects themselves are documents uh, within the Elasticsearch, sort of like hidden documents uh, in the Elasticsearch. So the total number of uh, wishes is uh, is this, and you can. Um, I guess one thing to mention for aggregations is you can combine filters here as well, uh, obviously, um, on different levels. Let's do one more. Oh, uh, let me first explain what it is. So again, running, what are we doing here? Oh, yeah, uh, running... Um, aggregation on the wishes, but in this case, we just want to see what are the most wished for items uh, by children. Um, and in this case, we're using full again, because we don't want to see the terms, and we couldn't actually see terms by default, because uh, as I mentioned, Elasticsearch doesn't keep track of what documents contain what terms, it keeps track of what terms are contained in which documents. Um, Right, so let's see the output of this. Uh, wow, so I guess children are wishing for woolen socks. Um, so that's the top hit, 315 occurrences. Um, so we, we, we asked for top five. So this, this is the top five uh, sorted by the doc count. One thing to notice here is, well, two things actually. Uh, but this is the more more important one, doc count error upper bound. So we'll, we'll hopefully have time uh, to look at this, but uh, Elasticsearch, uh, in this case, the uh, index is split into shards, and the shards are uh, searched across in parallel. So um, it actually sends the same query to the shards. All the shards come up with their own top five, and then uh, bring it back to the... Uh, note that received the query, um, and then uh, it will aggregate it. Aggregate it. So it might be that the top, uh, that the document or the wish on the sixth position in every um, shard actually had a, uh, an aggregated count that is higher than than all the other ones, uh, but was excluded from all the shards. So it sort of might give you uh, slightly incorrect tops. Uh, and this uh, this is the the maximum, theoretically maximum uh, document count of the item that would be left out from all the uh, shard results. Uh, so that's 105. So it's less than uh, the count of or the, or the count of the fifth item in the list. So it's uh, safe to say that we actually have the correct top five. Um, the counts here might still be different because maybe woolen socks only appeared in top five in four of the five nodes. Uh, shards. So we may be missing a few counts of uh, woolen socks from the 
the show that uh, it was not in top uh, five. Uh, right, let's move back to the presentation because we I want to sh uh, tell you how it actually works as well. Uh, right, so as I mentioned, uh, Elasticsearch is split into shards, so we'll talk about what uh, a shard is. Let's say we have, um, so Elasticsearch cluster contains of nodes. We'll start with one node that I had running on my laptop. Um, and in this uh, node, let's say we have two indexes, index one and index two. Uh, index one is split into four shards, one, two, three, four, index two into two. Um, all uh, nice and easy so far. Uh, one thing to note about shards is you have to define the number of shards when you create the index. Once the index is created, the number of shards is uh, fixed. You can no longer change it. Um, the reason for this is when, uh, when you index a document into Elasticsearch, uh, Elasticsearch will figure out which shard it belongs to based on by default its ID. And then when you want to update the uh, document or retrieve it by ID, it will figure out which shard to go for. And if you change the number of shards, then that logic would change and your documents would sort of disappear or uh, Elasticsearch wouldn't be able to find them anymore. So you can't uh, change the number of shards. By default, uh, every index will have five shards, but that's configurable. So let's say we add the node to the cluster. Node two. Right, so you can create as many indexes as you want. You, you might have, you might have, yeah, so index, uh, two indexes are completely separ uh, independent of each other. Um, you can, I only showed you an example with one, but basically you can have any number of indexes um, and they can have different configurations. If you have data that, th that uh, is logically separate, then you should put them in separate indexes. Um, yeah, for example. Uh, and also if you have data that, uh, that have very different mappings, you should put them on different uh, indexes as well. Um, right, so I hope I answered the question. But you can have any number of indexes. In this case, we have two. And uh, so now we have two nodes. And you, you, you add nodes basically for, I guess, three reasons. One is if you, if you have so much data that it doesn't physically fit on one machine, then you can just add another machine and split the um, split the, the amount of data between two or, or more machines. Um, that's one reason. Another reason is if you want to make searching uh, across your data faster, uh, then you can split it into uh, more nodes, and then uh, they can uh, th the search will happen faster. Um, so the so this index is split into shards, and shards are independent as well. And then you can, um, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, about the picture uh, very soon. Um, yeah, and the third, so the third reason is uh, just um, basically uh, if you think you might lose a, your, your node might blow up, then it might be useful to have uh, another node that contains the same data. That so that if you lose one, you don't lose all your data. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what the picture is. So index one still has four shards, but the, so the yellow shards are primary shards, and the uh, gray ones are just replicas. So they're sort of backup shards, uh, but they're also used for search. Uh, but the idea is if you lose, I if in this case you lo lost node one for whatever reason, you would still have all the data in node two. Beca but because index two doesn't have replicas, it, it shares the workload between the two nodes, but there's no copies of uh, the, the shards. So if you lost node one, you would lose half your data because you'd only be le left with uh, shard two. So it's useful to have uh, replica sh sh shard replicas if you, if you think you might lose um, nodes. And then if you have a third one, uh, again, balances, and in this case, uh, we haven't added replicas, so some of the shards don't exist on some of the nodes. But if you look at uh, index one, because there's one replica for each um, primary shard, actually, if you take out any of the three nodes, like any one of the three nodes, you would still have a full copy of uh, the index one, which is not the case for index two. If you took out this node, then you would only have half the data. 
and there's nothing for index two on the, the third node. Uh, any questions about shards? Or did I did I answer the question that you had? Uh, if you run out of space, well, sh shard isn't really something you can run out of space in because if you can, yeah, you can run out of space on a node. Well, then it can't uh, put any more data onto that node. Uh, you should. Yeah, yeah, you should. You should keep track of how much data you have or sp space you have available on your nodes, and then uh, make sure. Uh, yeah, so so index is the data in the index is split into shards. For um, you can run search uh, in parallel across shards, so you can make it faster, and you also you can move shards around. For example, if index two is very massive, we could uh, split it on uh, multiple nodes. Uh, do you define the boundary between search or what search does No, no, you don't. Th pretty much the only thing you do with shards is you. If you want, you tell it's two things. Uh, you tell the number of shards, um, or and you tell the number of replicas for a shard. Right. Uh, do you define how data is pulled between the shards? No. Um, the first layer or layer of the main. There's so you you can there's it, it basically uses hashing to uh, to figure out. Uh, how it's split across uh, shards, but by default you wouldn't, and you don't really need to. Uh, so, I hope this makes vague sense, because uh, the next thing I want to do is look at what's inside a shard. So a shard is a Lucene index. So now, we previously had the question, what's the difference between Elasticsearch and, and Lucene? So Elasticsearch is built off Lucene indexes, which are called shards uh, in Elasticsearch. And inside the shard, um, or inside the Lucene index, you will have segments. So these columns here are, are representing segments. Segments are of different size, and we'll, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, and a segment basically contains the documents. Uh, one thing to uh, member remember about uh, segments is that they are immutable. Once they're created, they're no longer updated. Uh, new segments are created. That makes it uh, just takes away the hassle of uh, locking and uh, makes it easier to cache. So when you index uh, new documents or delete documents, it doesn't actually modify the existing shards. It creates a new shard. And that, that's once, uh, sorry, segment. Uh, once a new segment is created, then that's when the uh, uh, documents will be searchable. So uh, if you remember, I mentioned that uh, they're near real time. Uh, so that's that's when uh, they become searchable. Uh, so by default, it's every one second. Uh, sorry. So every one second, we will have a, a, a new small segment. And if you imagine, if you had it running for a few years, you would have loads of those small segments. And it would be a lot of there would be a lot of overhead to uh, um, run searches across them. But also, because they're immutable, if you update the same documents many times, then uh, uh, you would have multiple copies of the same document, and when you're searching for it, it goes through all the segments. I would need to uh, throw away a lot of the, the, the versions of the same documents that it's found. Uh, so what, what to, to um, get away from this problem, uh, what happens is shards are merged, smaller shards are merged into bigger shards. Uh, segments, yeah. S, S word. Uh, s smaller segments are merged into sp uh, bigger segments. Sort of if you've played the game 2048, where you would uh, swipe smaller numbers into bigger ones, that's uh, sort of what happens. Uh, and that's when it removes the deleted documents completely from the segment, that the merged segment that it creates, um, and removes the old copies of the, the document as well. Uh, right, so what's inside the segment? Uh, inverted index. Uh, a term that we've heard a few times already. This basically takes the, the terms or tokens that were created uh, during indexing and will map the term to uh, the document. So for example, if you're using the standard uh, analyzer of welcome to the advanced Java meetup, you'd have a term welcome that would map to the document ID 
you would have a term two that would map to the yeah, document. Would you map one word to many documents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, that that as well. Uh, so it's sort of many to many, and it also keeps a uh, track of how many counts of a term you have uh, in the uh, in the document as well. Uh, there's the store fields, which uh, uh, just contains the raw values of the the document. By default, it stores a field called underscore uh, source, which just keeps the raw JSON of uh, the document. That's what it uses uh, when you actually want to get back the contents of the document. And then there's doc values. Doc values is what keeps track of what terms are within a document. Because in inverted index doesn't really know if given a document ID, it doesn't really know which terms this document contains. It or, well, it would know if you go through the whole uh, index, which is very uh, costly. Document values or doc values is uh, the lower round, where given the document ID, it knows which terms it contains. Y this is what's used for aggregations, for example. Uh, right. So this is everything I just said uh, on one slide. Contains of uh, cluster contains of nodes. Node contains of indices. Index contains of shards. You can have primary. Well, you must have primaries, and you can have replicas. Uh, you can change the number of replicas uh, as you go along, uh, which is nice. You can't change the number of shards. Uh, shard itself contains of segments, which uh, are created every one second or every time y you refresh, um, and then merged into uh, bigger segments uh, every once in a while. Um, and then uh, the segment again contains inverted index store fields and doc values. Uh, there's some other stuff in the segment as well. If you can, if you're really interested, go and look up what the how this thing works. Um, and I know I'm probably way over time, but uh, one thing to quickly mention is Elasticsearch six just came out. So for those of you who know everything about Elasticsearch and uh, have thought, oh God, awfully. Uh, boring this presentation is hopefully there's something new here for you. Um, I, I was actually running Elasticsearch 6 on, uh, on my local uh, laptop. And um, I think the most important change is you can only have one mapping type per index. You used to be able to have as many as you liked, uh, but the trouble there was that people m sort of misunderstood how types work. They thought of types like uh, tables in a relation database and indices as, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, schema, yeah, schemas or, or databases. Um, but that's not correct. Um, for example, if you have two mapping types with the field um, title, for example, which uh, in Wikipedia, in one case would be title of the art, uh, document or the, the Wikipedia article, and in, in another case would be title of the author, like Mr. or Dr. or Mrs. or whatever, then they would have to have the exact same uh, data type. Even though they're, they're in different uh, mapping types, they if you wanted to use one as a text with a keyword analyzer and another one with an English analyzer, that wouldn't uh, work. You would have a conflict. You can. Uh, you just can't create new indexes uh, with more than one mapping type. So the 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 the, the idea is to actually get rid of mapping types alt uh, altogether, so you only have indexes. But they want to do it very slowly to make it as li uh, as uh, little possible, uh, little painful as as possible uh, for people. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Another thing is uh, sorted indexes or indices. Um, so if you run queries which you always use the same kind of sorting for, then previously sorting would be done uh, at search time, which uh, has some uh, overhead. But if you always use the same sorting, then you can uh, sort your data at uh, index time instead of search time, and you would just have s uh, slightly faster uh, search queries. Um, support for sparsely populated fields. So for, uh, for example, if you have in a mapping type um, fields where the field is only populated in uh, very few documents and you have a massive uh, number of documents, then previously you would have an entry for every document in the Lucene index. This is no longer the case, so you space uh, save uh, disk space, basically. Um, 
cross-cluster search. So you can have multiple Elasticsearch clusters and you can search across them. You can configure the clusters to know about each other. Um, if you need this, go look it up. Um, sequence IDs, which makes uh, shard uh, restarts faster. Previously, if your shard went down uh, and was restarted, it would have to uh, communicate the to the primary shard to make sure uh, to basically check every segment that it had to make sure or, or, or figure out what it's lost out on while it was down. Uh, now, all the operations have sequence IDs, so it will know exactly where it left off. So it will just uh, replay what it uh, what it uh, missed. So it, you will have uh, faster uh, faster shard restarts, which, al which also means you will have faster node restarts. Um, and then finally, if you want to upgrade from 5.x to 6.x, you can have uh, you can do it in a with a no downtime upgrade. So I'm sorry I went over time, but this is finally the end of uh, my presentation.